Today we will speak about pelvic organ prolapse. As you all know, pelvic organ prolapse is a common problem. It's estimated about 8% of women in UK report symptoms of prolapse and more than 300,000 women undergo, undergo surgery a year in USA. So what is the definition of pelvic organ prolapse? Pelvic organ prolapse is defined as downward displacement of pelvic organ from their original position into or beyond the vagina. There is an enormous variation in the clinical presentation which vary from minimal descent to complete aversion of the vagina along with the uterus, bladder and rectum. Terminology based on compartment. So we have anterior compartment prolapse. We have posterior compartment prolapse. We have apical prolapse. We have interocele. Anterior compartment prolapse is herniation of the anterior vaginal wall. And it's often associated with the stent of the bladder, which we call it cystocele. Posterior compartment prolapse is herniation of the posterior vaginal segment and it's often associated with the stent of the rectum, which we call it rectocele. Interocele is a herniation of the intestine to or through the vaginal wall. And apical prolapse is herniation of the vault of the vagina and it's common in patients who had previous hysterectomy. Apical compartment prolapse, as you can see, it can be trine prolapse, vaginal vault prolapse in case of hysterectomy, and it is the stent of the apex of the vagina into the lower vagina to the hymen or beyond the vaginal enteritis, as you can see in the diagram provided. This apex can be either the whole uterus or cervix alone or vaginal vault. Usually, apical prolapse is associated with interocele. This is because apical prolapse usually is associated with both anterior and posterior compartment prolapse. So we have uterine presidentia in which there is a hernia of all three compartments through the vaginal introits. In order to understand the prolapse, it is very important to understand the anatomy of the pelvic support. Anatomic support of pelvic organs in women is provided by an interaction between the muscles of the pelvic floor and connective tissue attachments to the bony pelvis. The bony pelvis provides the architectural framework for the support of organs of the pelvis. The organs are supported by the fibers of the paracolpium, which is direct support, and by the levator plate, which is the indirect support. The fibers of the paracolbium arise from a broad area on the pelvic side wall over the fascia of the piriformis muscle, sacroiliac joint, and lateral sacrum. They insert in the lateral upper third of the vagina, with some fibers inserting anteriorly and posteriorly. These fibers are condensations of the endopelvic fascia and are composed of perivascular connective tissue and smooth muscle and contain blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerve. As you can see in this diagram, the pelvic floor, the elevator in eye comprises the pelvic diaphragm muscles, the bubocrogeus, iliocrogeus, buborectalis, and coccygeus muscle. Together they form a thin, broad muscle arising anteriorly from the posterior aspect of the pubic bone, just lateral to the symphysis pubis, and laterally from the white line of the obturator internus muscle fascia and ischial spine. The right and left muscle belly swing backward and downward to fuse together behind the anal canal and anterior to coccyx to form the elevator plate between these two structures. The anal canal, lateral vagina, and urethra gain some attachments of the medial margin to the elevator eye, 
derivative blade provides indirect support for the vagina by acting as a platform against which the upper vagina and cervix are compressed during episodes of raised intra-abdominal pressure. Narrowing of the urogenital hiatus also occurs with rises in intra-abdominal pressure. Based on that, the support of the vagina are divided into three zones, the upper, middle, and the lower. The fibers in the upper are largely vertical in orientation, while fibers supporting the middle section are attached to the side wall. The fibers surrounding the lower third are almost fused with surrounding structure. This diagram again shows the illustration of the pelvic floor muscles and the levator plate and how these muscles are interacting together to form support to the pelvic organs. Based on the discussion, we have three levels of pelvic organ support. Level 1, uterosacral and cardinal ligament complex, which suspends the uterus and upper vagina to the sacrum and lateral pelvic side wall. Loss of level 1 support contributes to the prolapse of the uterus and or vaginal apex. Level 2, paravaginal attachment along the length of the vagina to the superior fascia of the anal muscle and the arcus tendineus fascia pelvis which is referred as white line, and loss of level 2 contribute to anterior vaginal wall prolapse or cystocele. And level 3 is the perineal body, perineal membrane, and superficial and deep perineal muscles, which support the distal one third of the vagina. Anteriorly, loss of level 3 support can result in urethral hypermobility. Posteriorly, loss of level 3 support can result in distal rectocele or perineal descent. There are certain risk factors which predispose to prolapse, like age. We all know that postmenopausal women are more likely to have a prolapse because of estrogen deficiency, as estrogen helps to strengthen the muscles, and by loss of estrogen level, muscles start to be weak, and prolapse can happen. Parity. Childbirth increases the risk of pelvic organ prolapse. Obesity. Hysterectomy is a controversial risk factor. Race and ethnicity increase the risk of pelvic organ prolapse. As there is a genetic predisposition, also it is less clear, there does seem to be an ethnic influence, with lower rates of pelvic organ prolapse reported in black and Hispanic women compared to white women. Increased intra-abdominal pressure, in particular chronic increased intra-abdominal pressure, especially in patients with COPD, collagen abnormalities, and family history. For clinical presentation of pelvic organ prolapse, women with pelvic organ prolapse can present with any of these symptoms, feeling heaviness in the vagina, unable to completely empty the bladder and or bowel, constipation, need to use a finger to empty the bowel, difficulty using tampons, pain in the perineum or abdomen, difficulty or pain with intercourse, back pain, vaginal noise and or water going in the vagina. For clinical presentation, the most common and specific symptom for pelvic organ prolapse is feeling of a bulge in the vagina or a sensation of protrusion of tissue out of the vagina. In more advanced cases, the prolapse can be seen unpalpated, with the patient complaining of feeling of a lump. While some women may present with single symptom of prolapse, others may present with a complex of symptoms, include urinary symptoms of incontinence, frequency, nocturia, voiding dysfunction, fecal symptoms of incontinence and obstructive defecation, or sexual dis dysfunction. Bowel symptoms can include sensation of incomplete empty, 
and the need to manually assess defecation. The latter can include putting digital pressure on the perineum or splinting the posterior wall with the finger during evacuation. An assessment of a case of pelvic organ prolapse is very important to take comprehensive history to include bowel, urinary, and sexual history and to understand what is the main concern of the patient and what, is, what are her wishes in treatment. Then an assessment examination can be done in dorsal lacrimal position. However, if the examination does not illustrate the patient's symptoms, it can be done in standing position. As most patients in standing position, the prolapse will become more obvious. Remember to use SEMS speculum. It is used to systematically identify each component of the prolapse. To assess for the anterior prolapse, the blade is used to retract the posterior wall while inspecting the degree of prolapse of anterior wall and vice versa for the other wall. Rectovaginal assessment is important. First, to identify the tone of the muscles. Second, to identify the presence or absence of anterior seal. Neurological evaluation. As sometimes the case of prolapse is due to nerve injuries or neurological condition. So correcting the reason is essential before correcting the prolapse itself. And lastly is perineal ultrasound. Pelvic organ prolapse quantification system is our system which we use to identify the degree of prolapse. As you can see, we have nine main points in the anterior wall, two points A and B, and posterior wall, two points A and B, cervix is point C, posterior fornix is point D, and the genital hiatus, perineal body, and total vaginal lens. Looking more in depth into these points, so I can, as can you see in this diagram, mm -hmm. point A in the anterior wall is a fixed point, which is 3 cm proximal to the hymen, while point B is the most distal portion of the anterior vaginal wall. So point B actually is not a point, it's a distance, as you can see in the diagram. It can be any point between point A, A, and C. C is the cervix or vaginal cuff in patient having hysterectomy. D is the posterior fornix. But if the patient has hysterectomy, so there is no point D. A posterior is a fixed point, which is posterior vaginal wall, 3 cm proximal to hymen. And again, point B is the most distal portion of posterior vaginal wall. And the same as in the anterior wall, it's not a fixed point, it's a distance. So it can be anywhere, anywhere between A, B, and point D. Genital hiatus, which is measured from urethral meatus to the posterior midline hymen and perineal body which is measured from genital hiatus to middle of inner opening and total vaginal length which is depth of the vagina it should be measured without vasalva to more description of the points and also to help you for the quantification so as you can see and we said before point A in the anterior wall is located in the midline 3 cm proximal to the external urethral meatus, which corresponds approximately to the urethral vesical junction. It's a fixed point. This point, because it's 3 cm proximal to the hymen, so in it can be any number between minus 3, which is its normal position, to plus 3, which is complete aversion outside the vagina. So depending on that, we measure it in centimeters, and based on the measurements, we put it in the grid, which we discussed two slides before. While point B is the most distal or most dependent position of any part of the anterior wall. As we said before, it can be anything between point AA and the vaginal cuff. If there is no prolapse, point PA is minus 3 cm by definition. However, in women with total both strict me for prolapse, PA can have a positive value equal to distance between the vaginal apex and hymen plane. So the quantitative value of point PA can range from the most supported measurement, which is minus 3, to the most prolapsed portion beyond the hymenal ring, which even may exceed plus 3. Because it can be actually the total vaginal, the complete total vaginal length minus the 3 cm of the point A.
for superior points we have point C which is the most distal most dependent edge of surface or leading edge of the vaginal cuff post hysterectomy point D is measured only in a woman with a cervix it is the deepest point of posterior fornix corresponding to where the retrosacral ligament attached to the posterior cervix in measuring this point distinguish between suspensory failure of retrosacral cardinal ligament complex and cervical elongation this is very important because it will affect your decision about the procedure because if point D is in place this means that the case is a cervical elongation and not a trying to collapse and accordingly the management can be Manchester procedure but if point D is not in place this means that this patient has a trying to collapse as the different the management can be different For posterior vaginal wall points, we have point AB, which is located in the midline of the posterior vaginal wall, 3 cm proximal to the posterior hymen, and again the quantitative value can be anywhere from minus 3 to plus 3, the same like point A in the anterior wall, and point B in the posterior wall is exactly similar to point B in the anterior wall. Total vaginal length is measured by reducing point C or D to its most superior position. So total vaginal length is measured without valsalva, without traction. It's the only point actually which should be measured in the normal position. Genital hiatus is measured anterior posterior from the middle of external restrum hiatus to the posterior midline hymen. If the location of the hymen is obscured by a band of skin, usually from surgery or epidermal repair, the firm tissue of pronial body is the posterior margin of this measurement and pronial body is measured from the posterior margin of genital hiatus to the mid anal opening. Based on these points on the grid system, we go for staging. So stage 0 in which normal position of each respective site. Stage 1 prolapse where the given point remain at least 1 cm above the hymenal remnant, which is minus 1. Stage 2 prolapse where the given point descends to the enteroitis, defined as an area extended from 1 cm above to 1 cm below the hymenal remnant, so between minus 1 to plus 1. Stage 3 prolapse where the given point descent greater than 1 cm past the hymenal remnant but does not represent complete vaginal vault aversion or complete uterine presentia. This at least some portion of vaginal mucosa is not averted, or in simple word, it can be anything between plus 1 to total vaginal length minus 2 cm. And stage 4 is complete vaginal vault aversion or complete uterine presentia. Another classification which is baden walker halfway system, in which stage 0 normal position for each component, stage 1 descend halfway to hymen, stage 2 descend to hymen, stage 3 descend halfway past hymen, this stage 4 maximum possible descent for each side. The main three lines of management are physiotherapy, pelvic floor exercises, pessary and surgical management. Pelvic floor exercises is recognized as first line of treatment. We know it's important in mild degree of prolapse or stage 1 and 2. We know it can be less successful in stage 3 or 4 prolapse. Recent evidence from randomized trials have supported the benefit of pelvic floor muscle training, especially when involved in individualized training and supervision. The efficacy beyond 12 months is unknown. However, as it carries no risk to the patient, it should be offered to all patients who present with pelvic organ prolapse. Bessery. Bessery is one of the most common conservative measures used in case of pelvic organ prolapse, as it has advantages of being reversible, not invasive. Patient can give it a, a try and have bessery for some time and then if she wants to go for surgery she can have surgery 
Contraindication for battery in case of local infection, exposed foreign body, latex sensitive, non compliance or sexually active women who are unable to remove and reinsert the battery. We usually teach the woman how to remove and reinsert the battery during sexual activity. However, some women still unable to do that, and accordingly, the battery will be contraindicated in her situation. There are different types of batteries as you can see in this slide. Different types have different mechanisms of action. And it's a matter of trial and error. So the woman when she presents your clinic, you start by sizing which type which size of battery you will use and deciding which type of battery you will use based on the strength of the pelvic floor muscle and whether or not she still has a uterus. And then you try different sizes, different types, till you reach the proper type and size for the patient. The patient needs to be counted about that and need to understand that before going for battery. Because if the patient understands that, she will ask you to stop and she will feel that you are not confident enough in her management. In general, batteries are classified into two main categories, either support or space filling. The support battery is used to treat all stages of pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence. Space filling is mostly used for severe pelvic organ prolapse, stage 3 or stage 4. Both types are held in place proximally by the uterus or the vaginal apex following hysterectomy, laterally by levator muscle and distally by the pubic bone and vaginal enteritis. Space filling batteries and larger size batteries are often needed for severe prolapse as renal capacity can increase significant as a result of levator atrophy and an enlarged renal enteritis can allow support battery to rotate and be expelled. And it depends actually on the strength of the pelvic floor muscles and the vaginal muscles. If renal muscles can support the battery and can withstand it, so you can use the support battery. But if the vaginal muscles are really weak, in this case, space filling will be the most appropriate as it creates a negative pressure and act by suction power and it can be kept in place. Support batteries like Ring, Hodge, Chas, and Gehron while space occupying like gilhorn, donut, cube, inflatable ball, and spherical batteries. Ring battery is the most common used battery. The ring with support battery has a thin diaphragm across the ring, especially useful for women with uterine prolapse and or seal. However, it may be also used to treat seal and vaginal wall prolapse. Although ring battery is available in size 0 to 9, most women can be managed by size 3, 4, and 5. Ring without support, basically useful for in younger women, as you have less atrophy of levator muscles and a more oval contour of the vagina. The absence of support diaphragm allows the battery to take an oval shape and conform to shape of the vagina. For surgical management, before offering surgical management, it is very important to counsel the woman about the risk and the benefits to surgery and to provide her with the leaflets, up to date leaflets. Usually, we use the British Society of Urogynecologist leaflets. You can also use the International Urogyne Association leaflets, but the most important is to make sure you are providing her with up to date leaflets. And the, vagina, uh, and the approach to surgery will depend on the type of prolapse. So we have a general approach, it's anterior repair for cyst to seal, posterior repair for rectus to seal, sacral spinous fixation for volt prolapse, vaginal hysterectomy for uterine prolapse and the patient is uh, menopause or complete her family, facial exercise specific repair. It's still it's a controversial line of treatment. Some say that because the defect in the fascia is actually the cause of prolapse and accordingly by Suturing this defect straight away, it will help to correct the prolapse. However, on the other side, said it's better to, be, to do a complete 
correction rather than side axis repair. For abdominal approach and unimi, it's used mainly for patients with short vaginal acid and sexually active. It can be either sacrocolbexy or labastrocolbexy. In abdominal sacrocolbexy, we use a Y-shaped mesh. So the two limbs of the Y will be attached to both the anterior and posterior vaginal wall, while the longitudinal axis of the Y will be attached to the sacral promontory, the anterior, anterior longitudinal ligament in front of sacral promontory. It's done through the laparotomy and through laparoscopy, and you know the difference between laparoscopy and laparotomy in terms of recovery. It carries risk of bleeding, especially of the vessels running in front of sacral promontory, so cautious must be taken. Also, risk of mesh erosion, that's why it's very important to close the peritoneum over the mesh completely to avoid any mesh erosion. This is a schematic approach to management for patients with prolapse. So first is the patient elderly, not able to tolerate surgery, no longer desire vaginal intercourse. If it is a yes, then you, have, you can go for obliterative surgery like colbocleases. If it is a no, then you go for reconstructive surgery, which is repair. Second question is symptomatic stress incontinence or urodynamic stress incontinence or advanced apical prolapse. If it's a yes, then you should combine anti-incontinence procedure at the same time with the repair. If it is no, then there is no need for anti-incontinence procedure. There's nothing called the prophylactic anti-incontinence procedure. Third, is there cervical urethrine pathology? Is there a planned procedure requiring hysterectomy? doesn't desire future pregnancy, doesn't desire to preserve the uterus. If it is yes, so hysterectomy. If it is no, there is no hysterectomy. After hysterectomy, reconstructive surgery only. All operative surgery is performed via vaginal route. Reconstructive surgery if there is no hysterectomy. We know that there is a low recurrence risk, not able to tolerate abdominal route or prefer vaginal route. Then we go for vaginal surgery. If there is high recurrence risk or short vagina or intra-abdominal pathology, then go for abdominal surgery. Thank you for listening to Pelvic Organ Prolapse. I hope you enjoyed it. Muhammad Nashafi.